vibe. Hi, Bumi. Hi, Made. Nice to finally have you in conversation on um, my podcast. Thank you for having me. And thank you for being patient. <laughs> <laughs> okay so just just for the sake of people that that i know they would know your product but maybe not know how you look um on the show today we have made adeboye who is the ceo of green grill house and the maker of the most popular greek yogurt in nigeria i might say <laughs> and also the author of a book called um juice master um, actually two books two books okay well, please what are yeah. their names so that i quote you correctly okay so one of them is called the smoothie boss smoothie boss yes and the second one it's a book on um um marinades and salad dressings so salad dressings and marinades wow okay i was going to save this question for last but since you, you started with it let me let me ask so the 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 um, information in the books, are they on the back of your experiences and things you've tried, um, especially regarding the juices? You know, because I learned that um, uh, specific fruits go with specific fruits. So did you have to do, how much research did you have to do to be able to churn out a book that, um, you know, that is that, that you can rely on what the information is it's given? So basically, um, I didn't do a lot of research. It's just based on experience, um, based on lifestyle from growing up. So my dad, like I always tell people, my dad is a health freak. So growing up, we had to be making lots of juicy smoothies and stuff like that. So this is, these are things that I have um, um, knowledge I have acquired over the years. Secondly, I run... Um, Apart from the yogurt business, I run a healthy food cafe. So I'm one of I'm I, I th I'm the first person who set up a proper salad bar in Lagos. I don't I'm, I might even say Nigeria. I'm not sure because at the time when I started, you could only get salads and stuff like this in a proper restaurant like a hotel. So I started the first fast fast food healthy. So this is based on experience over the years. Okay, fantastic. I, I was going to ask you, one of my first questions to you would have been, were you always inclined towards business? As in, did you know from, from when you were younger that I like doing business? Or was it something that you just discovered by default over, maybe because some things happened, you know? So what, what led you to where you are now? Okay, so it's not something that I, I, I consciously grew up wanting to do. I'm a lawyer. Yes. I read law. I've been called to the bar, and my 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 life ambition. I wanted to be a judge. That's what I wanted to be. That was my focus. But then, like like you asked, things happened along the line. I also knew that I wanted to do business by the side because growing up, my mom had businesses. She had a store, and we used to work there, and we enjoyed it. So I knew that I would want to also have business on the side. I worked for about six, seven years in a telecoms company and I wasn't happy after a while. I wasn't fulfilled. I wasn't getting promoted. I was just stuck in one particular place. And uh, the plan was to work in a different department and then move to the legal department. But I didn't get to do that. So along the line, I got bored, I got tired and I just quit. And then I started my business but while i was working i was also doing business but a different uh type of business and when i quit i now focused on the food business okay so you know I, I, when i was preparing for this interview i was trying to remember what happened around the time you started and i think you correct me if i'm wrong the time you started was a time when i think it was a trend in Nigeria to eat healthy. There were so many um, diets coming out, so many um, people into advising people on how to lose weight and all those things. You know, so um, I thought that perhaps the time in which you started was also very good because, you know, there's this school of thought that, um, that says it matters when you start a business, you know. Um, I read a book, Outliers, and, and in that book, they, they said, um, I think they said um, Bill Gates, 
someone someone like Bill Gates tried to start what Bill Gates, the Microsoft, um, before Bill yeah. Gates, but because the world wasn't ready for ready. for for that yet, it didn't succeed. But when Bill Gates came into the picture, the world was ready, and that's why it succeed, succeeded. But then there's another school of thought that says you can start anytime, just start something. Okay. Like Instagram, for instance, started in 2008 when there was a recession. So what do you think? Yeah. Do you think it mattered? It matters. I think it matters. I think it matters. But for me, did it at that particular time people weren't really into it. So what I start I didn't start just doing salads. I started by making home cooked meals. That was my focus because when I was working meals, food. Okay. Because when I started, I remember when I was working, I didn't like the food in the canteen. In the office. It was monotonous. So every day I used to bring food to work and my colleagues would, you know, I'll bring enough that maybe, you know, a few of my colleagues and they enjoyed it. It was home cooked. So when I left, I was like, okay, why don't I do that? And just provide home cooked meals. But I always had a side of salad okay. for whatever meal, because that was how I grew up. Whatever food we made, there was a side of salad. And then I noticed that people stopped ordering food so i would have uh i would make like 10 um packs of food and at the end of the day i'm left with um eight packs but the 10 packs of salad i made were all gone gone so i'm like why do i need to do because uh, excuse me the jollof rice that i'm making they have jollof rice in the canteen they don't have salads at the canteen so I just started, I said, okay, let me concentrate on that. So I think at that particular time, people were gearing towards eating healthier. And then the type of salads I made, I didn't make the regular salads, which we all knew. I did all sorts of different types. I mixed different things. So it was an experience. It, 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 I think it started something new. Wow. Okay. So um, what made you introduce yogurt into the mix? As in, I'm just, because you know, I think back then you could just buy yogurt. I, I think I'm sure I'm sure many people don't even know the difference between the normal yogurt and the Greek yogurt. So, what made you think that yogurt would succeed? Because if I'm right, I think it's your best seller now. It is my best seller. It's my, it's my, that's my cash cow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know when we, um, I mean, we we went to secondary school together. So right back then in secondary school, my mom had a yogurt factory. Wow so we i worked in her yogurt factory and it was selling like crazy at that time we sold yogurt between zaria because we lived in zaria so between zaria kano kaduna abuja that was our access and um it was really selling so when what you know as a as a as a teenager you don't want to do any work it just seemed like a lot of work and then right after school uh, my dad taught me how to drive so I became the driver of the, I was supplying yogurt, going to collect money. I was working in the factory. I was doing all that. So it just seemed a little bit too cumbersome for me, but I had the experience. I knew how to do it. Then my mom comes visiting. And at that time I'd opened my cafe. My mom came visiting and she's like, oh, why don't you add yogurt? And I'm like, ah, like, like God forbid. Ah, no, no, no. Because yogurt work is plenty work. I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. I said, no, 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 no. I don't have power for that kind of thing. You know, the experiences from my uh, childhood came back, all that work that I didn't want. And then she's like, okay. Then she goes to the market, comes back. And by that evening, she has made a, 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 a bowl of yogurt. I wasn't happy about it. I wasn't happy about it. She made it. And then she, my mom doesn't know how to cook small she made so much that we i didn't have a choice but to take it to the shop meanwhile when she went to buy all the things she had even bought containers everything so she had packaged it and then we took it to the store and then people were buying by the by that evening they called and said ah the yogurt that you brought has finished my mom said oh she still has more milk and stuff she's going to make more so she made and then we started then we started making parfaits i'm like okay i will use the yogurt to make parfaits we started making parfaits and then people started buying the yogurt people started buying the yogurt and that's how i got roped in i i don't even know how but that's how i got roped in and then 
took it up from there, started selling, but I was only selling in my store because I wasn't NAFTA certified. And I didn't, I didn't want the hassle of having to make in large quantity. Like I said, it's a lot of work. It's very stressful. Yogurt is sensitive. Anything can happen and spoil the whole batch. And then because of that, the demand was getting higher and higher. I went and I got NAFTA certified. Wow. How long did it take you to get your NAFTA certificate? At the time I did it, it took me about nine months. Wow. But I assume the, the process is a lot faster now. Am I correct? Yes, it's a lot faster now. And actually, I even used, um, there's this um, government um, place called TIC, um, Technology Incubation Center. So I went through them. They assist the entrepreneurs, make it easier for you. So I think it did it. Yeah, I think it took about, no, I don't think it took nine months. Probably maybe like six months. Six months. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So so let me ask, at what point did you leave Econet to, to do this full time? As in, had you reached a certain stage where you were self-sufficient, where you could pay yourself a salary from the business and then you were confident to leave? Or what, what was that turning point for you? I just left. I was tired. I was bored. And I didn't see my career going anywhere. So I left without even a plan. I left without a plan. And at that particular time, um, I was going to start some fertility treatment. So I didn't need the hassles of work where I wasn't even happy. So I spoke to my husband and I said, you know what? I'm not a lazy woman. You don't need to give me money. Just make sure certain things are paid for okay. and I'm mm -hmm. fine. I will find something to do. I will. And that was when I now started doing the food. So I was at home. That's okay. why I left. Yes. I didn't leave because I wasn't, and I wasn't, self, I wasn't paying myself a salary because I was just, it was just, you know, something small at the time. Okay. 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 So tell me about your experience with um, getting into the retail stores. I know you're in spa and shop right because I've, I've seen your product i've even bought it from there before so um which one was first and how was the pitch like how did you what was the thing that you think you did that made you succeed because you know you can pitch to buyers and they might not necessarily like your product or take it so yeah. what do you think was the um reason so for we're success? actually we're actually in over 200 stores in lagos wow we're in abuja kaduna kano potakot akure ibadon um Oweri, Kalaba, yeah and so when i when i got my navdak i now started going to stores myself with my product now another thing that i that i'm very big on is packaging i love good looking practical Packaging. packaging so i packaged my product very very well and i'd gone to stores there's a neighborhood store where i live called renee and i went there first and i spoke to them i said i have this product i have to leave samples blah 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 they weren't too keen but they said i can leave the sample and that's what i started doing i started leaving samples around 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 and then the thing that i kept telling them was that I know my product. If it doesn't sell, it's of no cost to you. I will come and take it. You don't have to pay me. Just let us see what it does on the shelves. And that's what I did. I started going around and I started learning more about how to pitch my product, what I need to take, because I would get there and they say, Oh, do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have that? So I will now know. Okay. So with time, I started, you know, knowing exactly what to take who to go to, who to look for in the stores. And now I even created a course, how to get your products stock ready. Wow. And which people have been using and, I mean, they've been getting into stores. Okay, I'm going to include um, that, um, how we can access that course um, in the um, link that I okay. provide with this interview so that people can look at it because I think that's really important. And what, what one key thing that you said that I, I am taking note of is that you started small. You didn't just go for the big 
stores. No. Um, <laughs> I started with the smaller stores because because of capacity. I didn't know if I could meet demands. I started with the smaller stores, and then smaller stores would tell so you know they, they have like a network among themselves and when you get to speak with the um, procurement person the procurement manager most of these procurement managers have worked in other supermarkets or they have they have um hired product um procurement managers for other stores so when they get a good product which is selling they will call their colleagues and say ah there's this product they have this is the person's number then they will call us so now to be honest Bumi. We don't go looking. We are oh, the ones who call. You are too popular now, as in. <laughs> <laughs> so now they call us to say, "Oh, we want your product. How much do you sell?" This, that, that, that. Okay, so that brings me to a question that I'm curious about. It, because you are dealing with um, perishable things, I I always wondered how you handled being in multiple locations in multiple cities. So do you do you do you centralized production and then distribute to other states or you have locations within those states that um are able to do the same thing you do no so centralized i have one factory here in lagos and everything that is in every store comes from that same factory however like i mentioned my mom i, I told you i grew up my mom had a yogurt factory which is still yeah. there the building is still there and I have just renovated it. I'm planning to buy equipment. And this store is in Zaria. I'm buying, I'm planning to buy equipment and then start another factory over there. Because right now, um, we distribute outside Lagos by air. Because it can't wow. stay. It, it's perishable. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's perishable. So we distribute by air. We cargo it. So one hour, it's in the city so it's not spoiled and we use styrofoam boxes so now i'm trying to get i'm trying to um revive the factory in zaria so that zaria will will, will cater for the north and from lagos we can handle the south okay uh -huh. that makes sense because i really wondered i was like ah, it's so sensitive how would you get it all the way there and by air it's pretty expensive okay but i'm wondering do you have economies of scale such that um that added expense because you are doing so much in quantity you're able to spread it across the product so that it doesn't then become too expensive for the yes producer. and also also the products that are sold outside lagos are slightly higher to make up for the um, um the extra um, cost of the extra cost of transportation it's um, okay. um slightly higher slightly higher okay okay so um another question i i i have is i know you had a um, first mover advantage because you pioneered um, the actual packaging and and distribution retailing of um, greek yogurt you know in um, nigeria so but now many people do these things many people are into yogurts and uh, smoothies you know so does that um does that extra competition um thin out your margins or you are way ahead so it doesn't really change your um your your revenues the thing is that Nigeria is very, very large. Nigeria is big. To be honest, I haven't felt any difference. And I know that other yogurt producers are also doing well. So Nigeria is very large and people have, have, the, have options of choosing whichever product they want. For me, what is important to me is not looking at what my competitor is doing, is maintaining my standard. I'm a product. I'm 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 a I'm a creature of habit. If I find one product that I like, which like. suits me, I'm not going to move. And that's what that, that that that's a mentality. I I presume all my 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 customers have. When you find something you're comfortable with, it's not making you sick. You're good with it. The price is fine. You don't. There's no real reason to move. Mm -hmm. So that's what that, that that's it for me. That's it for me. Okay, okay that works. Okay, so let's let's talk about your structure. Now you have, um, well, I, I can't list all of them, but I'll list the ones that I know. You have the Greek yogurt. You have, I think, um, Greek yogurt for children as well. You have um, some new drinks as well. Then you have the food section. Then you have you as a brand plus your books. <laughs> so so which which um. 
which which products make the most for you um what kind of margins do you enjoy and um okay let me pause and allow you to answer that first the yogurt the yogurt the yogurt does the most for me the yogurt okay. is like i said that's my cash cow that's what mm. that's 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 my big business mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. how do i manage all of them yeah with structure with structure so i have um the cafe runs on its own it's in the how, how are you it able to create that structure that allowed it to run over on time its own? over time it wasn't overnight over time i made a lot of mistakes but now i've gotten the hang of it and i've created a structure to the extent that um i had i had my children in 2020 during covid mm -hmm. so i got pregnant in march just at the beginning of the lockdown and because of the circumstances around my pregnancy i i didn't I didn't go to work for the whole period from March. My staff didn't see me till November. And for two, I think two or three months when the COVID started, the shops were closed. But after that we resumed and the shop was working perfectly. It was what was because we have a structure. This is you wake up. Um, I said, wake up. You start at this particular time. This must be ready at this time. That must be ready. If this, this is how you troubleshoot, blah, blah, blah. So they didn't need me. I was there at the background watching, um, um, getting reports daily and stuff like that. And till now, I haven't resumed fully. My babies are almost two. I still have not resumed fully. And it's still going and it's still making money so that's what that's that structure okay so it, so um I, I know you said you built that structure over time but what were the um lessons some of the mistakes you made that made um that you were able to learn from and then helped you improve that structure how how do you staff how do you keep staff because i'm assuming that because you have reliable staff is why the structure would work in the first place so how do you solve yes. this kind of problem so Part of the mistakes I made was not being consistent. Today we'll open at 8 o'clock. Tomorrow we'll open at 9 o'clock. Tomorrow we'll open at 10 o'clock. This is not ready. This is not available. Stuff like that. Secondly, somebody can just decide I'm not coming to work and nothing happens. So we had to put a proper structure in place and make sure that, okay, we have uh, SOPs, you know, operating procedures. This is how it has to be. Even our food, our recipes, it has to taste the same way it tasted yesterday by today, mm -hmm. which means we had to um, do the exact measurements. How many cups to go with, how many broths to go with, how many, um, um, what way of vegetables and stuff like that. And then my staff, to be honest, are the best staff in the world. They are wonderful. I don't change staff except a staff is leaving on their own free will, but I hardly, hardly ever change staff. And that's because I create my, the working, my work, working environment is more like family and I've brought them into the business. So they understand my passion. It's not just about money. And I've told them if it's about money, I wouldn't continue this business. I would go and sit down in my factory and just face that because I can see lots of lots of money there. But so we're like a family and they are passionate about it. It's not even just, a, I mean, I have a um, customer service background from um, telecoms when I worked. So that I instilled in them, my values, my passion, the mission, everything I instilled in them and they have been working. I mean, I have people who have been working with me seven, eight years. Wow. That's fantastic. I have people who are working. Even in my factory, I have two people who started off as um, helps in my house. One now is a production uh, supervisor. And the second one is operations supervisor. And they started uh -huh. off in my, in my kitchen at home cleaning my house mm -hmm. and they're not even educated but they have you know with right. time 
yes yeah. with time and I, I i i i register them for courses different courses i get people to come and train my staff so it's a i, I think they're in a they're, they're working in a good environment so they really have no reason to leave yeah okay okay let me let me take you back to something you said about when i asked you what was the um thing that made you succeed when you were pitching to the retail stores and i think you said packaging so i know that you've changed your packaging um not too long ago and you know me looking from the outside i was like it's not it, there's a slight change in the shade of green and the size of the container but i couldn't see anything significantly different but then again you know it's like I got braces and people asked me what was wrong with your teeth before, but I knew what was wrong. So, I knew... <laughs> so you, the owner of the product, would have known what you needed to change. So could you explain to us why you change your packaging and why it's important? Okay, so one of the reasons why I change, so you, like in business, you always have to be one step ahead. Mm -hmm. You always have to be. The packaging we were using before, we started using that packaging for yogurt. Mm -hmm. And then by now, like, a million and one people are using the same thing so i wanted to stand out i wanted to also use um a packaging that's of international standard so that's the difference with the new packaging it's of international standard that's what you find in the stores in the us you uk dubai anywhere that's what you find and then also i'm looking at exports and when you're looking at exports you have to have international Internet. standards yes so that's it also a lot of copycats have kind of um copied my my design so and my fonts so when you go you probably see if you're not somebody who knows my product very well you see and then you're not sure is it is it so you have to actually look to see who produced it so those are part of the reasons why I changed the packaging. Your, your later reason was what I suspected because I, I, I think I listened to Tara um, talk about her product once and I think she said she had to do something similar. It was either Tara or another cosmetic uh, maker that people were copying. Um, yeah, so people are not, machine. people don't have, they are not imaginative. I mean, you can use something no. as, I mean, I, not, none of my designs is of 100% mine. But I, use, I, I get inspired by other designs and then I would now create my own. But some people just copy and paste. <laughs> yeah, don't mind us Nigerians. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So another thing I wanted to ask you, I think I listened to one of your other interviews. I, I, I think I, I saw it on YouTube and you said you went to business school. Did you go to business school? Yes, Lagos Business School. Uh -huh. yes. So I wanted to ask you, because, you know, now there's a school of thought that says um, traditional education doesn't teach you as much as um, um, learning from YouTube or people it's that great. have actually done stuff, you know. So I wonder, that is it important to invest in, in a business degree, an MBA, especially if you want to be an entrepreneur? And then the other thing is that, do you is it best to do it before you actually delve into business? Because, I mean... I'm assuming that if you if you do it first, if assuming that they are actually able to teach you practical things, you would have that information before you start the business. Or is it better that you've actually started and then you can then take some of the actual problems that you're experiencing into the school and ask? You know what? You know, you know what I think. I don't think you can learn everything in school. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. There's a lot that you can only learn from experience. Yeah. But the business school guides you i don't have an mba what i did was an uh entrepreneurial course for how long I, um it was for about nine months i think i can't even remember it's been a long time ago <laughs> but that's what i did and it 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 guided me i was already in business it guided me but even after the course i made tons and tons of mistakes so like i said you can't learn everything from the books from school. the books are practical this 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 but reality is not especially in nigeria you may you you will not be able to follow the book to the t because our circumstances are different our situation is different so a lot of things you have to you learn on the job i would advise if you can afford it take the course 
there's no knowledge that is wasted. Lost. You would mm -hmm. use it. You would use it. But also, learn from people who have been there. I've, I mean, I, I remember a time when I used to put out a lot of um, um, things on my um, Instagram handle about mistakes I've made and stuff like that. And I'm very sure people have learned from it and not made that mistake. Yeah, yeah. So, so in hindsight now, your law degree, is there anything that you've been able to use in business now from your law degree? Yes, solving solving problems and fights, dispute resolutions. <laughs> because when you when you're working, I have about 30, 32 staff. Okay. And there's no way there's no going to be clash. Conflict, yeah. Yes. So I've used that there. I've also used it for um, people who come to us with proposals. I look through the documents. Also, I've let, I've um, I've used it with with the Lagos State Government people who come from nowhere with the, from the blues with all sorts of taxes and levies. And I stand my ground. I'm like, on what grounds? Why would you charge us this for what? What's the mm -hmm. justification? So, I mean, I think it comes into my daily life. Okay, I think okay, so. that's cool. Because you know, the problem is. <laughs> Sometimes, if not for the fact that um, I, I work in finance, I, I'd say maybe thirty percent of what I learned in school is what I use now. This, the rest, I can't even. It, it has nothing to do with you know what I'm I doing know, now. Oh yeah. Wow. Well, okay. That's somehow, cool. somehow we will come in because you know it's knowledge that is in there. It's just there, mm -hmm. it's just and you don't even know. You, you're not you don't even you're, you don't consciously use it but somehow when you it think helps. back you're like okay it's because of this i learned this that's why you know i was able to do this okay cool, cool, cool. Then i want to take you back to the um business model because i think i didn't really get all the um all the things that i wanted to find out from you from there so like the the um i don't know if it's confidential but i wanted to find out what kind of margins do you enjoy i'm asking because there are some people that will be trying to set up businesses and they would want to know how much margin should i put on my cost price as in what, what would be good enough to ensure that i take care of all my expenses and uh, i'm sustainable i'm able to make enough profit to sustain me so how do you so what i'm saying in in, in essence is What's your margin? How do you price? Are you able to take in all the costs, all the expenses, and incorporate it into your cost completely? You know, that's what you, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. Put all your costs, your production costs, operation costs, then get your final cost in. That is what you're supposed to do. And then you now have to put a margin, 30%, 40%, depending on what. So um, like for us now, we just increase our prices. Yeah, I but, that. but extra 30 percent because operations costs have skyrocketed mm -hmm. cost of production has skyrocketed cost of materials have skyrocketed so we had to measure all that and then yeah. increase it by 30 percent okay. so basically that's what you need to do you need to put all your costs together now it depends some it depends on the business and uh, depends on the demand that will all will determine how much percent you are going to put as interest on your so it's not it's not fixed do you understand it's not fixed mm. it depends on your business if you're somebody who sells rice you don't need to put so much because you know you're selling off that same day you can't make it so expensive mm. you know you have to sell it because you can't keep it that so you're just there like you know all these people that sell by the roadside mm. they are just dishing it out so the profit margin doesn't have to be much but also the product one bag of rice can give you so there's profit okay the price you would sell your yogurt from from your cafe is it the same as the price you would sell the yogurt in uh a retail store. A supermarket. A supermarket. No. Yeah. No. Okay. That is because we don't have control over what how much they sell. We just have mm -hmm. control over what we give them. We give them a recommended retail price. And the recommended retail price is what we sell in our stores. Yeah. So some of these stores sell for less because they are doing volumes. Some do promos and sell for less. Some sell higher, but it's just always within a 500 Naira uh, 
re range yes it's always between that and then some of them for example if if like two three stores are on the same street or around each other they are competing with each other so they might take theirs down 50 naira 100 naira just to make other um the customers come to them instead of come. yes okay. okay but one thing important... with us is um our prices are i mean in my own cafe our prices those are the recommended retail price and a lot mm -hmm. of people prefer to i mean if they are around lucky they buy from us directly because it's fresh we produce every day we produce every day so you know that that's a fresh batch that just came okay so what happens in the store if um uh you have products that are after the best before date that so that's the good thing we hardly hardly ever ever have products that expire hardly we okay. sell out but when we have things like that we have a sale on return um um arrangement with the stores so if it expires we take it okay. but he hardly okay okay yeah okay that, that's fantastic another important question that I, I wanted to ask you is is funding how are you funding all these products you know i, I stalk you for for your information i, I stalk you on Inst on instagram on both your handles <laughs> So I ha you know, I was just seeing baby pictures, the twins. I was like, oh, this is fantastic. And I was like, how are you coping? How's you, you seem quiet on your business. And then one day you just posted uh, pictures of your new machines. I was like, oh, this is great, you know. But I was like, ah, this is expensive too. So how do you fund all of this expansion, your plan to export, you, the factory in Zaria? You know, how do you do all that? Hmm. We've been self-funded, practically okay. self-funded okay. from inception. But I got a grant from CBN. Wow. Um, a grant? Yes. About about four years ago. Wow. And that was what I used to buy my first equipment. I didn't know CBN gives grants. I, I, I know they give subsidies, they doing, but I didn't know they give grants. They were, give, they were doing... Uh, uh, there was a program they were doing something and i was lucky i was like this only i was we were only two from lagos state and i was picked i don't know anybody wow. there just well, happened so, what, so but what put put you in the position to be picked as in were you were you a part of the school a school from where from what pool did they pick as in what happened i don't know that there, there was uh, i applied okay and i okay, was Okay, so there was a natural um, process, as in they asked people to send in applications. Yes, yes, yes. So, so people sent in, sent in their applications and everything, and I applied, and I was okay. picked. Wow, wow, that's fantastic. How much so was that's how, I, that's, how I, <laughs> that's how I got my first um, equipment. But mm -hmm. to be honest, it's been really, right now, with the state of the country, it's been really tough. Um, yeah, I, I was imagine. hoping that my factory in Zaria would have been set up by now, but it has stalled. Mm -hmm. It has stalled because, I mean, financing and um, the banks are not really helpful. They give you loans of 20 something percent interest. How mm -hmm. do you how, how, how do you recover from that mm -hmm. when there's really no money in the economy right now? Mm -hmm. So it's been really tough. It's been tough. But most of the time it's been self-funded. My husband has come into no. the business mm -hmm. and injected funds so that's how we're that's how, what that's what we're doing our new machines was completely self-funded wow okay but um um you, you know cbn gives some subsidized loans uh yes. they, it was at five percent i think they've increased it to nine percent now you know yes. so i, I know it, it sometimes it takes a long time in coming but does the fact that you had a grant from them preclude you from applying for no I, I i actually tried to apply but i don't know it's just been um, a long process it's been a long process so mm. i got discouraged and i left it but maybe i'll pick it up again okay and the and the machinery that you you bought i'm assuming you imported it so um yes. did you have to go to, i'm assuming it's china i don't know but did you have to go to china to learn how to use it as in how how were you able to buy i went and then... i didn't buy it from china okay I bought it from somewhere else, somewhere in Europe. <laughs> okay. But I went there, yes. Okay. I went there. We we were we were going on vacation and then we decided to go through that country so that we could 
visit. So we visited the factory, we saw the machines and um, chose what we wanted. And then my husband is um, has a background in engineering. So okay. the, he knew the basic workings of the machine. And then by the time they brought it to Nigeria and we installed it, we got somebody here who also has knowledge about the knowledge. machine. And then the uh, manufacturers did us, a t did us tutorials via video call. Mm -hmm. So that's how we set it up, yes. Oh, fantastic. That, that's so great. I always like hearing people's success stories. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to let you go soon, but I, I, I like to ask all the people that I interview um, some a particular question. I asked them two questions. So I'm going to ask you my first one. In your course of business, what is something that you've discovered that most people don't know? about the food business or about business in general? Something not common that you just discovered because you're in business? Something I've discovered because I'm in business that most people don't know. Could be anything. It, it could, yeah, so I think, what, what I think I've discovered is that don't, don't, don't copy because you think that product or that person is making money from it. The person might make money from it, but you wouldn't because it's not your passion. You don't know anything about it. But some people just say, oh, this person sells yogurt. Ah, be like, say, yogurt, they sell. You delve into it. You don't know anything about it. That's, I, th I think that's very, very important. Do what you can do, not or learn before delving into it. I've seen many businesses come up and then crash. Okay, okay. Then my last question, if you had to do it all again, what would be the one thing that you wouldn't do again? If I had to do it all again, what's the one thing I wouldn't do? <laughs> what's the one thing I wouldn't do? Hmm. I probably wouldn't have wasted so many years in paid employment. I would have gotten wow. into this earlier. Yeah. Wow. I, I hear people say that a lot, but you know, it's the it's the fear of the unknown. As in, you are leaving um, the known for the unknown, and and, and and you know, some people don't actually make it and end up back in paid employment. Yes. So it, it's yes. actually scary. I can imagine. It, it's it's scary. scary. When I was leaving, I left without any job offer or anything. I left to go home and sit down. <laughs> so it was scary. But my husband was very supportive. supportive. Like, you're not happy, you're not happy. You don't have to. My parents were supportive. And I know that I'm not lazy. I knew that I would do something. I just didn't know what I was going to do. Wow. Okay. Okay. That is fantastic. <laughs> it's been lovely having you. I I've learned so much. You know, I, I could go on and on and on with you, but I, I don't want to make the interview so long so that my, my listeners will not tune up before will not get bored. <laughs> that you've shared. So thank you for 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 taking the time to talk with me. I, I don't thank take it for granted. I'm so grateful. Thank you for having me. And thank you again for being patient because I know you have chased me and I've I, in fact no, no, I understand because I, I do this for most of the people that I interview because they are busy. And um, for you in particular, I knew that uh, you're handling twins business. I knew that it would be it would be difficult, but I was like, I, I know it's my day. She will eventually. She will eventually. <laughs> I, I know, you know. I, I, it made me remember something I wanted to ask you. So, so I I remember you know I told you I I, I stalk you on Instagram. I saw what is one interview you did with the um, BBC on um um fertility infertility I yes in nigeria infertility. yes uh -huh. so I, I wanted to find out i was just curious how how did that happen did they just approach you or what, what made them pick you for the interview because of your peculiar experience or was it because of the business that you run that you already were popular um enough for them to, to no so um i've been very vocal about my journey my infertility and um so somebody i think they had approached some they approached someone else and then she told them that she, i mean i should be on that interview because i have a story to tell that's how it okay. happened so okay. they she gave them my contact and then they contacted me and asked me um okay. do you mind they have doing a okay. thing and it's going to go viral it's going to be i'll be exposed and i'm like i've never hidden my story so let's go okay uh